Pacer Nation, what is going on? Welcome back to another episode here of your go-to Pacers podcast, Setting the Pace. And we got ourselves some Pacers basketball tonight. Unfortunately, the Atlanta Hawks escape with a victory, 131-130 to on a Seth Lundy game-winning three off of an offensive rebound, off a missed free throw. And the only reason he was fouled, Fachi, is because the Pacers fouled to avoid giving the Hawks a chance to make a three-point shot. And what happens? It ends up biting them in the butt. Should they have fouled? It's easy to say after the fact. I mean, you just, I think sometimes you just kind of forget, like, this type of thing could happen. It feels like it's happened to the Pacers more often than not. You think of, like, DeMar DeRozan going through a similar scenario last year, beating the Pacers. But this this was disappointing. It, it really was. I'm not going to lie. I thought the Pacers absolutely 110% had this in the bag. I, I, I was stunned when this happened. You saw my face when we went to start recording. I know it's preseason. I was disappointed with the outcome. Yeah, I mean, uh, we got Rooster dropping F-bombs left and right tonight on Twitter. Pacer basketball is back. Pacer basketball are. is officially back. I mean, he's back. like, how not a foul on Cole Swider? What the? You know, I'm like, whoa, Rooster, calm down. It's game one of the preseason. This I game know. doesn't matter. But I love the passion. And, you know, I told Fachi, I said, my man, the Mets just won game three to go up two to one against the their rival, the Philadelphia Phillies. It's and here Fachi is, you know, so, sad. He's sad because the Pacers lost a meaningless preseason game. What priorities, brother? I like I like the Mets. I love the Pacers. And I know it's preseason. I missed yeah. the team. And, uh, and, you know, we had the moments early on in the game. There was good vibes and there was bad vibes. And then it was back and forth. And at the end, you know, I just wanted them to be like, all right, hey, we won. In the end, trust me, no one's going to remember this preseason game. It's like when we were dwelling when the Pacers lost to the Hornets last year early in the season. You forget about that as time goes on. But in the end, it was just good to see the boys on the court again. Well, let's just talk about the stuff that actually matters because tonight, Miles Turner – misses the game with a leg injury. James Wiseman gets the start. So you're already kind of looking different than you're going to look for the regular season. You have the four starters from last postseason run with James Wiseman. And the 15 to 16 minutes that they played, they were a plus seven as a group. They were kind of clicking. Obviously still some kinks they can, you know, work out. But I thought for the most part, Andrew Nimhard looked very comfortable in his role. Pascal Siakam, there was no answer for him on Atlanta's side. Tyrese didn't shoot the ball incredibly well, but I still felt like, you know, he was getting some good looks and things like that. So I felt like the starters overall, you, you saw that, you know, solid play. And I think they kind of lifted James Wiseman more than he really made a difference for them. But James Wiseman, kind of a, a big talking point here. I saw you were pretty excited about what he did. And it's funny because you're like talking about that. And then I'm going through my Twitter feed and I see Caitlin Cooper say, Oh, I can't wait for Miles and Ijax to get back. So I'm like, okay, where are we at on this? You know, there's two sides of the coin. There is, there is. And and look, you know, when it comes to an X's and O's, Kayla knows. You know, she, she knows. Um, I just thought that from this was a good opportunity for, for James Wise to be able to get a start in a game that didn't matter, but just see how does he play with the starters. I felt like he fit in. I felt like he's someone who didn't need the ball. He, he was able to get good open looks, had a good touch around the rim. There was a time where he got an offensive rebound that ended up leading to to Nemhard basket. And uh, I just felt like it was like, hey, you know what? If this is the early look on James Wiseman. I like what I see here. And I really do think that Indiana is going to be able to unlock his potential. But the starters looked good. This was an Indiana team that went up 22-5 to in the first quarter. Now, don't get me wrong. They ended up trailing. Before the first quarter was over, uh, 35-31, but they had their moments, and I, I thought to see James Wiseman with that group just gave me a lot of hope because I kind of thought, well, he's probably going to be with all the other backups. It'll be hard to get a good look at him tonight. I saw this guy belongs. Yeah, I mean, at first, I thought like the first five, I guess first three or four minutes of the game, he looked much better than the yeah. second go around when he came back in with the starters. I think that the Hawks kind of got settled down a little bit there were times where he felt like he was out of position defensively and still trying to figure things out. But, you know, it's just – it's one of those things where it's kind of like the Pacers' offense is such read and react. And with Miles, he can do so many more things in terms of, you know, spreading the floor where Wiseman's more of a guy that's going to be hanging around the baseline. So I do think that there is just a little bit more of a, you know, 
unfamiliarity there with James and those guys in the starting five. So maybe that was where some of the hiccups were. I think defensively is more so where I was worried about just not in a position to get the right rebounds against Clint Capella, uh, you know, blocking shots. I mean, he had a couple there. I thought he was going to block one in a transition. I think it might have been Ricochet, but Ricochet just got it right over him. So Ooh, he looked good tonight. Ricochet. Wow. I, I was very surprised. That, that's the first, and I'm going off topic over here, but I would say out of all the things that really stood out in this game, it was that Ricochet could play. And I know it's, yeah. yes, it's preseason, but it was impressive. The Hawks broadcast made you realize it a little bit more too. So I think that probably did influence what you were seeing. But at the same time, you know, he, he looked good. I'm not going to lie about that. But for the most part, I mean, I thought Nimhard and, and Siakam to me stood out with the starters the most. I, I felt like Neesmith was just uh, not very good tonight in terms of uh, efficiency scoring wise. Yeah. You know, just kind of felt like he's more the best shot that he took was a catch and shoot. The other ones I didn't feel like were all catch and shoot. There was a couple off the dribble where I'm just like, that's not his game. I don't like that part of his game. I, I just like him more as a catch and shoot guy. So there's just going to be so many options, but I will just say this two things that stood out for the starters. Number one, the confidence Nimhart played with offensively. I think that that postseason run really did kind of unlock that for him a little bit in terms of just like him growing as a confident player. And number two, we got to talk about Pascal Siakam's three point shot because that shot, it looked pretty good. And he wasn't just shooting him from the corners, he was shooting him from, you know, the uh, from like the corners and not the corners, um, the elbow, elbow three pointers. And I, I thought that he looked pretty good. So I, um, I thought those were the two things that stood out to me with the starters. Yeah, I, I thought Siakam's three ball definitely looked good tonight. Siakam just overall looked really good, and that's what's that's enough to get you excited about this roster is everything we heard about Siakam in the offseason to now to having him just from day one of what you want to say of the offseason, day one of the regular season, however you want to put it, it's going to make a big difference. You also saw that chemistry. I mean, Tyrese Halliburton with a beautiful behind-the-back pass to Siakam in transition finishes that. I thought that, that was great. Like This starting group – Looked good, and you, they would only look better if you had Miles Turner in there. What we also didn't talk about before is Isaiah Jackson was out in this game, so this yeah. really was like a good showcase for for James Wiseman to have that extra opportunity. But yeah, you still want to see Turner out there. I'm gonna be honest; I didn't really know that Turner had an injury coming into this game. Maybe it's, it's late pretty... scratch. Okay, yeah, I didn't hear much, you know, before the game or before today. So hopefully, that's just a very precautionary thing. It is preseason; he is a veteran. We don't need to, you know, put him out there just to put him out there, but. Uh, you want to see this Pacers team healthy when it matters most. And, uh, you know, overall, I think your point on Neesmith Smith was, was very fair. Defensively, it looked good. Offensively, always kind of looks like the fifth starter. And I, yeah. I think, uh, you know, nothing changed tonight. But Nemhard, like I mentioned a couple episodes uh, recently, saying that, like, I think that you know, Nemhard could be the Pacers' most improved player. Tonight, like, a night like tonight didn't make me feel otherwise. So I'm yeah. very excited about Nemhard this year. No. I, I was blown away with Nemhart early on. I just thought, man, this guy looks so comfortable right now. And it, it's great to see. And I think we're just going to continue to see him blossom. With, with Tyree's getting so much attention, you know, they had Trey Young guarding Nemhart. It's like, are you kidding me? Like, you know, the first shot of the game was uh, for the Pacers. That was a made basket was that little floater he had over Trey Young. It's like, you can't really hide guys on Nemhart because he'll make them pay. I think you'll probably want to hide them on Neesmith if you're any team, just because his offensive game is limited compared to the, the remaining four players on in that starting five. So, but even then, I mean, this was not, not a slouch offensively. Like he can still do some damage, but it's just, he has to pick and choose. Now, one thing I didn't bring up yet, and I, and I should have brought this up earlier with the starters. I, I like seeing Pascal kind of bring the ball up the court sometimes in initiating offense more. I know we saw at times last year, but it, it felt like it was more often like, Hey, if, if Pascal got the rebound, Hey, let's push it and go. It wasn't like, oh, let's kick it to one of Nimhart or Halliburton every time. It was, we're just going to run, we're going to run, we're going to run. And I know people have said, are they going to slow down their pace because they want to be better defensively? No, not at all. I, I think that they're going to continue to play the way they played last year offensively. It, it wears teams out. It's their strength. And defensively, they can get better in other areas. So I just like the fact that they were doing more iterations of Pascal initiating the offense, getting them into their groove, and not just always being one of the guards doing that. And, and we saw, I think there was one where like Tyrese like told Pascal to take it and Pascal didn't see him. So Pascal like threw it behind him. So then Ty had to kind of go get it. It's just little things like that are, are what you notice in a preseason game that hopefully get worked out in the regular season playoff time where, hey, we're, we're more than just a bring it up and, and set the offense up. We can do so many different things.
I mean, you even saw by the voting today that Rick Carlisle was voted. I believe it was the the most innovative, uh, you know, head coach in in, in basketball or most best offensive, offensive coach. That, that's what it was. Best offensive coach in basketball. Pacers were also voted most fun team to watch. I, I think that kind of goes hand in hand. Like this offense, Pacer style basketball, it is here to stay. I mean, you saw. I mean, I know it's the the Hawks. They put up 130. The starters only played half. You didn't even have Turner out there. It's like. This Pacers team, if the starters played, this could have been, I don't know, what, the third time in a row we hang 150-plus on the Hawks. But, you know, we don't want to look too far into it. Um, but anyway, uh, I, I thought that for Siakam, when you're talking about bringing the ball up, I mean, he's always been a gifted passer. Four assists in this game. I think it's an underrated part of his game. Uh, but overall, I felt comfortable with the starters that this team has chemistry. They're going to be good. One point on Halliburton that I don't like because it kind of gave me PTSD of the playoffs is six of his seven shots come from three-point land. You just want to see him be able to you know, take someone off the dribble a little bit more. It could always create for others or just be able to bring it into paint just a bit, you know, a, a run or any, anything of the sort compared to just settling for threes. It reminded me of, you know, kind of against the Knicks or anything like that. So uh, I know it's uh, – I don't want to say I, it's just the preseason for the 18th time, but I want to see him be a tad bit more aggressive in the regular season. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. I mean, I, I think that – it seemed to me like he was not fully engaged. Exactly. That's the right way to put it, right? Like, when like he was engaged, but it was to the point where he wasn't going 100%. Like you could tell mm -hmm. Tyrus was probably playing at like 75. Yeah. And I, I think that just kind of goes hand in hand. I don't think it's the biggest thing, right? Nobody left injured. So that's the biggest thing, right? That's like the one thing you want in a preseason game is nobody leaves with an injury. So we avoided that. He debuted his shoes. He's got a new contract with Puma. He's going to be wearing those those new shoes. I forget the name of the brand, but it's like the Nitro or something. But yeah, uh, it's it's a cool opportunity for him. I don't know if he's going to have his own signature shoe yet, but maybe he will. Maybe we're in I the – I Yeah, I, I do too. I just – I don't know if it's coming out this year, next year, when it'll be, but it's a very cool partnership for Tyrese and Puma, and I thought his dad did an excellent job in that commercial that they did. So Major Look was, was the headline there. And so his dad, I mean – John Halliburton That's is one of the most fascinating great. people to watch on television. So those two together, I mean, if they don't figure things out in the NBA for the next 15 years, those two together could be so much fun in WWE as Tyrese as a wrestler with his dad as his manager. But anyway, we don't want to think about that. We're talking about Pacers basketball here. So starters, I think we can kind of tie a bow on that. Let's yeah. move over to that first group we saw with the second unit. Who stood out to you? I think TJ McConnell is TJ McConnell. It's just like, you know, he 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 looked like McConnell. Four for four from the field. Just, you know, he was doing his, his routine shots. That was great. He had a couple steals. He had a block. Uh, assist. He did a, did a little bit of everything. You know, um, I think that McConnell was someone I was like, okay, great. They didn't skip a beat. I think when you look at some of the other ones, uh, for, for Jairus Walker, um, Walker in the beginning, I thought, I want to say his first four shots were all three-point attempts. And I'm like, is Jarris Walker really going to be a three-point shooter like that where he's shooting at, like, a high clip, but maybe from a percentage standpoint, I just don't see him being, like, kind of like a marksman. So I wanted to see a little bit more. He had, he had a good take maybe towards, like, the second half. Um, Mathurin had a good dime to him. But, I, I mean, I don't want to go through everybody right now before you chime in, but I guess one of the main takeaways I would say was that I mean, I think you could have hoped for a little bit more of like, whoa, Matherin's back. You know, like we saw, you know, oh, he, he, there he is. We didn't see that tonight. We saw Matherin who can get to the free throw line, which we've always known, but inefficient from the field, two of seven. So a performance to forget. But a comeback. Rusty night. I, I, yes. I think that's a big thing for Matherin is just you got to say, you got to continue to say, Rusty. Yeah. I'm, I'm not ready to write in Matherin off by any stretch of the mean. I think there's some fans who are just like, he is just not a good fit here. I mean, there was one play. I might have been in the third quarter. I can't remember, but he's trying to run the offense, and he like runs directly into like the path that TJ's dribbling the ball or whatever. And I'm just like, he's just got to kind of shake this rust off, get himself back into game shape, and get himself reacclimated with how everything's going. I mean, he know I know he's been working on a shot. The numbers really didn't prove that tonight in terms of his shooting efficiency, but I, I think it's just going to take some time for him to continue to figure things out. I thought Ben Shepard looked active. Yeah, I, I I know that there was some you know med plays here and there, gotten some foul trouble early on. I mean, I think he just a little bit too foul, you know, handsy there, getting in too much foul trouble. Jarris Walker, I kind of felt like it was hard to recognize him out there. Like that to me is yeah, 
one of those things where you're like, oh, we shot a few threes here, but it was kind of like, okay, Obi's Obi felt much more dominating and or dominant in, in terms of what he was doing on the court comparative to a Jairus Walker. And that's why when people are like, man, this second unit, they look so discombobulated. It's like, well, you got to realize like Matherin's shaking off the rust and Jairus is getting his like real first look. And like these guys have so much pressure on them from the, from the coaching staff because they're asking them to do different things. than I wouldn't say that they're not good at, but they're basically trying to challenge these players to grow and kind of like expand their game a little bit instead of staying in the bubble that they're in. And so as they're trying to evolve, you can tell like they're not playing as loose. They're not playing as free as maybe a Nimhart or a Halliburton are. They're playing with, oh my goodness, I'm overthinking every single thing and trying to prove themselves, trying to get that playing time and prove their worth. And so it's, it's not like it's a bad thing that their gears are grinding, right? Like they're trying to figure things out, but what I just saw throughout the entirety of the game, really, it's just, you know, Matherin like wanting to make a play here and there to try to like feel better about himself, get his confidence exactly. going. It wasn't falling. Jairus, you know, like afraid to bring the ball up, throws the ball to Obi, puts him in a bad spot. Obi turns the ball mm -hmm. over. Just little things like that where it's just like they just don't feel as loose. Like they're just like, I can go out here and do what I want to do. They're trying to fit into this system. And it's just, to me, I know I'm talking for a little bit here, but I'll let you come back in right now uh, after I finish this sentence here. But I just felt like they were a little bit too in their heads and, and not just playing freely. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to start when the when the, the the bench came in in the first quarter, I mean, it was just not good. I feel like all of a sudden the Hawks immediately started to build that comeback, and that's thirty to nine run to close the first. Ex exactly, a oh, thirty to nine run. Like I knew it was bad. I didn't have the number right in front of me, but whoa. You know, it, it was not good. Um, and yes, I, I saw like there, there was a time where Jarris, I felt like, had a wide open basket. He did definitely give it to OB, and I felt like it was like, okay, all right, the guys are trying to get each other involved. We saw Matherin try and get others involved. He had three assists, but yeah, like the there was a significant drop off in production from the starters to the bench. I know the bench will be better in the regular season when you're balancing it out a little bit more. You're not just, you know, doing these like hockey shifts of, you know, five players at a time, but. Uh, I think the guys that you know you can count on, like your Obi Toppins, I think they're going to be more than fine. Your TJ McConnell is going to be more than fine. Now you want to see, okay, all right, let's let's. let's – I'm not looking into a fan jam shooting performance from Benedict Matherin. I'm not. I'm not. And this one is whatever. But there's a couple more preseason games. I just want to see him just continue to shake that rust off so we can have a little bit of a better idea of, you know, just what we could expect off the bench. We obviously have expectations – Hey, this is probably going to be the guy who's going to lead us in scoring off the bench. Okay. But you want him to be efficient. You don't want him to be, you know, averaging 15, 16 points per game on like 42% shooting or anything like that. So I'll have to give him some time. Uh, you know, for Ben Shepard, you talked about that, that he nailed some threes in, in the second half, and that was good. So I think that for the most part, kind of covers that group of, of five. Let me, let me just say this yeah. real quick because. I felt like last year in the playoffs when the offense ran through McConnell, right? And he was kind of not like, I guess he was, he was kind of the primary scorer for that second unit. Yeah, at one point. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. When Matherin went out, I thought things looked better when he was kind of the primary scorer. Now you can kind of see him trying to facilitate to get other guys involved and he's not looking for his shot as much. So I'll be curious to see how they coach him come regular season time it's it's going to be is it going to be one of those things where they're like hey mcconnell we want you to take over a little bit more offensively where we you know maybe don't give matherin the full reins like we had kind of previously where matherin's kind of the go-to guy i know matherin's ups like you know upside is so much higher but like oh yeah but if you're trying to win games and matherin's still looking rusty not shooting the ball well and i, I know mcconnell can kind of uplift your team i i think that they might go that route just because McConnell can pass the ball so well. And I think that's a, another area where Matherin's really trying to figure it out. I just don't like, he had a terrible law pass to Obi top. And I don't know if you remember that play or not, but it was like, he drives and he's trying to make the right play. Like I, that, I, I respect that about it. He's trying to make the right play, loses the ball in the throw. The ball gets stolen. Larry Nance Jr. Gets the rebound off the, like the bad pass off the backboard. And instead of getting back on defense, he just sits there and starts harassing Larry Nance in the backcourt, trying to get a steal because he's trying to like make up for his mistake. Well, Nance kicks it out to Trey Young and immediately sprints down the court, and Matherin just kind of watches him. And all of a sudden, here's Larry Nance, runs right by him, 
They give him right back to Nance, puts Ben Shepard out of position. He has to foul to keep Nance from getting a wide open dunk. And it's all easily preventable if Matherin just gets back on defense. And so it's not just necessarily to me, oh, shake it off offensively with the rest. I think defensively he has to get better too because that's what's going to get him on the court. And I felt like too many times in this game I saw where he was kind of not able to maneuver the defense correctly or maneuver the offense when they were setting picks and things like that defensively and get around guys. So it, it's this is a work in progress for him still. I think it's going to take some time, but we saw how much the game reps really helped him last year, right? Because as he was coming out of all-star break and before he got injured, he was playing some of his best basketball. So he hasn't really played since then, and I think that's just a good reminder for we've seen it before. He can get to this point. Let's just give him some time to get there. Yeah, I'm, I'm not worried. This is going to take time, and if it needs to take three more preseason games, then, yeah, go for it. Because uh, I think there's there's 82, maybe even 83 games, however you want to break it down, of what it could be nowadays in the NBA. Um, and then if you look at where the playoffs are at, hey, there might be 100 games. Uh, there was 100 games that the Pacers played last year or more than that, uh, and then with, with Obi Toppin, I think it was exactly 100, actually. But either way, a lot of basketball to play. I'm not worried. But when you, your point back with McConnell – and I always feel like every year there's like kind of like a little bit of a leash on McConnell. And, you know, well, we're going to hold him back. He's not going to play as much. And then eventually he just gets unleashed. And you're like, well, this guy is so good. And it'll happen again. It will. There will be a time where McConnell's taken over again. And you're like, you know what? Yeah, this is the same guy that the Knicks were fearing. He was putting fear into the Knicks in that playoff series. And I, I feel like... Hey, this is a guy who, I don't know, I mean, maybe you make an argument that T.J. McConnell is in the prime of his career, coming off of his best season, biggest contract. Like, you know, he's uh, he's going to be ready to rock. So I'm not worried about those guys. When you when you look around to, to the rest of the team, just one name I want to throw out there, Cole Swider, I think at times, I think when you were talking about, we talked about recently, you and I, could he really push Kendall Brown for that last spot? We knew Cole Swider could shoot. We knew that. He's, he's been historically a good three-point shooter. Six rebounds tonight. I, I thought it was awesome. And some of those rebounds were a little bit tough. Tough to get. There was actually even a two-on-one where he was able to, to kind of play some good defense and, and, you know, avoid an easy basket for Atlanta. And I feel like for when you're looking at Cole Swider versus Kendall Brown, uh, Kendall Brown's got, got a lot of ways to go to help his case a little bit. Yeah, I mean, the fact that Swider got into the game earlier, I think that's a sign of what they maybe want to see. There was a rebound. I do believe that he like dove on the floor and kind of fought two Hawks for it and, and got the Pacers the ball. So it's just little plays like that. And I think Kendall had some nice runouts as well. Kendall is just, he had a terrible play where he got stripped really easily. That was really bad. It was a yeah. bad strip. And then it led to like a full court pass. And like the, the crowd was on their feet. It led to a timeout. It was like, that was just such a momentum killing turnover right there. Yeah. It's, with Kendall, the bad is really bad, and the good is good. It's okay. Like, he's just got size, and he's quick, and he can dunk in transition, and that's about all he can do. Like, if he gets his hands on a pass, like, that's really exciting. I don't ever think he's going to block shots when I'm watching him play, but he is athletic-looking, right? I mean, there's there's that that he's got going for him, but, you know, Cole Swider doesn't look like nearly the athlete that Kendall Brown yeah. is, but... He just, uh, you know, he just finds a way, and I and I and I like the game of Cole Swider. I thought Enrique Freeman brought some nice energy energy mm -hmm. to the game. You know, still pretty raw. I, I'm I'm trying to figure out the Tristan Newton fit. I don't think it's a great uh, fit right now. And if I were looking at where he's at now, would not be surprised if he's not here next year. Kind of like we saw uh, with yeah, Oscar Shibway on a two way deal. I, uh, I I won't lie. I almost tweeted it out. I didn't, but I said I really miss watching Oscar right now in the fourth quarter. I wanted some Oscar Shibwe Fletch. I really did. I, I do too. I mean, look, it, it's just the way that the man rebounds. It's it's fun to watch, but we'll have to watch from afar. Hey, Oscar, good luck in Utah. But yeah, for Tristan Newton, I feel like he's, you know, he is what he is. A couple steals, got to the free throw line, you know, five attempts, but that I just last feel like shot he took was so uh, terrible. Yes. Yes, it was. And I think you just look at this and it's like this is a guy that was a fifth year senior on a really good UConn team that got him as far as he can go. And, you know, I, I see the G League for him that, that like long term. It's hard for me to see him as an NBA player. But for Kendall Brown, these next couple games, they're they're gonna be key. They, they really are the preseason that I don't I mean, I'm sure he's gonna have a big opportunity maybe for the last one or so to be able to showcase 
something, but I don't know how much there is to showcase. And I think for Cole Swider, you look at this, he got 10 shots up. He only hit four, but a lot of them looked like good shots. Well, and I think the field goal attempts. Yeah, he did. And that's pretty surprising because it's in 16 <laughs> minutes, but in the second half, he was letting them fly. He was not afraid to seize his moment. But I also do feel like there's an opportunity where Cole Swider could have went, I don't know, four of six from three at, at any point. And us been like, wow, yeah, you kind of want that shooting on the back end of the roster if anything's to happen. And we obviously know that, you know, um, I, I don't think Kendall Brown's really going to be pulling up from three anytime soon. And and I just feel like right now, Cole Swider, Enrique Freeman, those were guys that I was like, okay, all right. And uh, Freeman had a, a pretty, for his one basket that he had, you know, from the field, it was a tough basket. It was a tough basket to make. I was like, okay, this, this, is, this is great. This is a guy who's, you know is going to give you good energy. And I think at times, like you talked about, I mean, he's a long shot to have a real NBA role. He had three turnovers tonight. But, like, this is a guy that was a walk-on in college. Like, he's going to get better and better and better. And then one other thing that I want, they didn't give him credit for a block, maybe more just a deflection. Late in the game, James Johnson ha had a deflection. I, yeah. I thought that was going to seal the game. I really did. I I couldn't even tweet it out in time because there was so much happening. But I was like, did James Johnson just put this game away? It's a good thing I didn't because we lost in the end. But it was cool to see. No, I mean, you know, it's funny. James Johnson is just getting out there at 37 years old playing fourth quarter basketball in preseason time. It's a time to be alive. And I think maybe had Isaiah and Turner played, you probably see just Wiseman out there with that group instead of Johnson. And I'm sure Wiseman probably doesn't look as good if he's not I completely playing with the starters. Agree that. Yes. So that that to me is kind of like the case that I can understand with Caitlin. Like, wow, she's probably thinking like, okay, you know, the starters are uplifting Wiseman. He's not lifting them up or, or like totally. fitting in with them. So, um, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I, it's such a hard conversation here with a guy like uh, uh, Enrique Freeman because I want to see more of him, but he just, he's a little bit undersized for me at good the story. five. He's a good but. story. And yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. Is like, do we see Enrique Freeman being able to contribute to this team in, in a, a clutch situation or meaningful minutes? At, no, I, I don't think we do, but I'm definitely rooting for the guy. And I want to see him like be able to develop in the G League, get a ton of playing time and just be able to make the most of that. And who, who knows where that could take him maybe a year from now. That's that's how I feel. I just, I don't know. And and I will say this. I know me and you in Summer League were both like, oh, you know, I don't see how they keep Quentin Jackson. They got to keep Tristan Newton over him. I was wrong. Uh, so was I. I got to keep Quentin Jackson over Tristan Newton at this point. Uh, if you're going to pick between the two. I really agree. Quentin yep. Jackson came in as a first, third string point guard for this team. I guess you could say four string technically. But he ended up playing for McConnell in the second half as his backup and didn't really come out of the game. Um, he had some really nice moments, some athletic moments on that throwdown that he had. Got some crazy handles, uh, not crazy, not crazy hops, excuse me, not handles. Uh, he's not the greatest with the basketball in his hands, actually. So I think he's more of like an off ball guy that can handle an occasion, but not like a true point guard to, to what I've seen from him. But I do like the athleticism, just feels a little bit more sturdy. And I think that the experience that he has is what, you know, in, in the G League and things like that and playing some NBA games. You can just tell he's a he's a notch above Tristan uh, Tristan Newton in terms of experience in the league. So I, I'm not knocking Newton for that. I'm just saying if you had to pick between the two moving forward, I can see why they would like Quentin Jackson more just because of the upside there and just the experience, athleticism, size. He just has a little bit more. And I just don't really know how Tristan Newton fits in with this team at the style of play they want to play. It does not feel like his style. Yeah, I, I think for Quentin Jackson, it's like – in summer league, he had like that one really bad first. He was like the first game, the second game. It was like a bad performance, and I think that kind of put a little bit of a stank on him, which was unnecessary. And I think that you look at this now, and it's like he's a fringe NBA player. He really is. You look at Tristan Newton, and it's like I don't know if Tristan Newton, and I know said this sounds maybe a little bit harsh. I don't know if he plays like an NBA, like a real NBA minute. Like I, I don't know. But I also, I look at Quentin Jackson, I see this is a guy who is a fringe NBA player. Like He could make a roster at times. Like He scored, I think it was one point last year. It was something like that for the Pacers. But he had played a couple of games in the past for the Wizards. And uh, I, I just feel like that's someone. Well, I, yeah, I would know. Yep. <laughs> you got me. But no, look, he, he did make a couple appearances. I was just looking at it. Nine games, six points. Like, I, I just feel like. 
It's going to be tough, but he could have moments. Tristan Newton, more of a long shot to me. But uh, Quentin Jackson, I think, is someone who sees his opportunity tonight. Yeah, for sure. The The worst part about games like this is not being able to see Johnny Furphy out there. Johnny Furphy. That was tough. Yeah. He also did not play in this game because he did have an injury, and and, and I think it was an ankle injury. He kind of had a sore ankle going into the training camp and then hurt the other ankle, so he's trying to kind of come back from that. But go back to the GM survey – uh, that this that the league put out today. Mm-hmm. I think it was John Schumann for NBA.com. Pacers drafting Johnny Furphy at 35 was tied for the steal of the draft. And I always oh, find man. these to be so hilarious to me because these are from GMs saying this. Who won that? Okay. Johnny Furphy <laughs> fell to 35th in the draft, and you're calling yep. it one of the steals of the draft. You had a chance to draft him. What is going on here? Why Why did so many people pass on him? And now... After a little bit of summer league play, they're calling this the steal of the draft. How did nobody draft this guy earlier if they felt like this was the number one steal of the draft? I have no idea, but I love every part of it. It's crazy (laughs) because some of these teams that probably did have, there probably is, I can't remember right now, probably one or two teams that probably had three picks and passed on them three times. And great, thank you. I think that Johnny Furphy would have been one of those reasons to get extra excited tonight just to have that, like, okay, great. Give, give me some Furphy. What do we got? Give me 15 minutes or so. We didn't get that. I don't know what the situation is going to be for his ankle as it relates to the preseason in general. It would be unfortunate to miss the preseason because I do think that this would be some good basketball to be able to mesh with actual, you know, role players and maybe starters or so. I don't know if that would happen, but um, I hope it's not a missed opportunity. But at the same point, I fully get, like, hey, there's no need to to force him to be out there when the plan is to have him in the G League. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I just I'm just so bummed for him that we didn't get to yeah, see it. And exactly. I'm bummed for our fans because I think mm-hmm. that the Pacer fans would really have enjoyed seeing some Johnny Furphy off ball movement. And I think it would have opened up this offense a little bit more than maybe playing, you know, Kendall Brown out there. But I think it would also kind of open up more opportunities for Cole Swider. To, yeah, that's true. to solidify himself potentially as that 15th man on the roster. So I mean you know, it's a opportunity for one person and then another disappointment for another, right? Because they can't play and show what they got. But, you mm-hmm. know, he'll have plenty of time uh, in the G League, like you said, to kind of showcase what he can do. And it'll be fun to see. But I think that's going to wrap it up for this game recap. And I know we always um, enjoy doing these, but we're going to end things today with another edition of the Hot Take Corner, Fachi. So we've got one basketball hot take and one non basketball hot take. So. Kick us off, Fachi. What's your what do you want to go with first? Do you want to go basketball or non basketball? I'll go with the basketball one. I'll go with the basketball. So maybe a little lukewarm. I don't know. I mean, it's not hot. Maybe it's mild. I'll say we'll say mild. It's that I'm gonna say that the Indiana Pacers have two all-stars representing us at the all-star game. In order for the Pacers to have two, it means they probably have to be about a top four seed. So I'm going to say that Indiana has two all-stars going into the all-star game, meaning that they are about a top four seed. And uh, that means the Pacers are playing some good first half basketball. Those all stars, Tyrese Halliburton and Pascal Siakam. If you're wondering, well, that's not that hot. Well, the Pacers haven't had two all stars in quite some time. I mean, I believe you're going back to uh, Paul, George Paul George and Roy Hibbert, um, and that's 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 quite a while. That's 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 been about a decade. So think about that. It's been yeah. over a decade now since uh, the Pacers. I want to say that might have actually been was it 2012. It might have been 2012. It was the last time. 2012 maybe it was or 2013. I think it might yeah, have been 2013. I think, was, I think it was 2013. So you're talking about it's now been over a decade. I think the Pacers snapped that streak this year. Okay, Fachi. I like the hot take. I like how you're keeping things current. Yeah. And not giving us some old school hot takes. No, no, no. Man. Okay. Where do I want to go with this? Because I... Okay, I'm going to throw it out here because I thought about this last week and I didn't say it. Bring it. If the brawl doesn't happen, oh, Pacers still don't win the championship. Really, that is pretty hot. That's pretty. It's pretty spicy. Um, okay, I want to believe it because I'm a Pacer fan, but I just think there was too much turmoil between whose team this was between O'Neal and Artest, and I feel like that at that point Artest was just not in a good headspace. So even if had he played the remaining at least 68, 69 games, whatever. 
they might have had the number one seed, but I just think that Detroit team probably gets them in the playoffs. I know that's a hot take, and I know nobody wants to hear that, but it's just I just feel like we put so much of like, oh, they could have won a championship had Ron, you know, not done that. But it's just like if he wouldn't have done the brawl, he would have had to have done something else, right? Like I just, I just he, don't he, think he mentally was he was all the way there. Yeah, he he was definitely due to you know to snap at some point. But here's my here's my question to you is it that they lose to detroit or is it that they lose to san antonio in the championship good question i think detroit probably still gets them i think that it's just one of those things where reggie's getting a little bit older yeah, and is. that pistons team they they just knew how to win games in the playoffs i don't their defense would just take it to another level and it was personal yeah no, it wasn't. That, that's why I'm wondering because it's like the Pacers were a good defensive team, you know. You know, during that time, but Detroit was like the best defensive team. You know, I think they were giving up. I mean, it sounds crazy now, but like it might have been like I don't know, 90 points per game. Just some of the low 90s. I'd have to see what that number was because I feel like the league's changed so much. It feels weird even throwing out that number. But um, if they if they had gotten past Detroit, I do think they could have beaten. San Antonio, but at the same point, it's hard for me to guarantee that when you look at the amount of Hall of Fame that are on that team. So I think while some could definitely say it's a hot take, I, I think you do have a, a, a big argument there because of when you look at both of those teams, the amount of Hall of Famers that are on both sides versus the Pacers situation. I mean, you have Reggie's a Hall of Famer, but at that point, that's not Reggie in his prime. You look at some of those Pistons teams, a lot of those players are really in their prime. And yeah. then obviously San Antonio. I mean, they're they're not done winning championships for another decade. So I, yeah. I think sadly you might be making a great argument. I, I would just if, if it if it wasn't Detroit, I think San Antonio probably does defeat Indiana in a seven game series. It's just Tim Duncan at that point with Tony Parker, Manu Ginobili, like they were just such a solid team. And I I I think Indiana maybe could have given them a run for given them a run for their money. Maybe it goes six or seven six. games, but I don't know. I just Popovich probably was at that point a much much better coach than Carlisle. Yeah, early tenure Carlisle, like he still had some really good ideas, really innovative coach. But I think Carlisle now compared to then is just a totally different person. Oh, so, big time, big time. You know, that's I mean, experience you, for you. Yeah, it, it really is. And obviously, I mean, you look at uh, Carlisle; he ends up not winning a championship with. Uh, the Mavs until probably about seven, eight years later. So it's like it, it really took some time for him to be able to break through. But that that, that is that is a pretty hot take. But I, I might unfortunately be agreeing with you. But I think Man. that that's one where I would love to be hearing from other people because I think we can really go either way on it. We we really could, and I think both arguments are are deserve to be heard. For sure. All right, so let's get into our non-basketball hot takes. Now, do you want to go first, or do you want me to go first? I think we should keep it. You go first, because I like okay. the element of surprise with you. All right. Yeah, because you never know which angle I'm coming from. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you are a chicken wing lover, and you order boneless wings, I think you might be a little bit confused. I think what you love is saucy nugs, not chicken wings. What because I'll tell you... I had, I had, it was by mistake. I've had boneless wings plenty of times. I wanted chicken wings. And I went to a place and I said, oh my God, they got Thai chili wings. Yes, sign me up. What I got was legitimately chicken nuggets and a cup of Thai chili sauce. And I had never been so disappointed in my life because that's a nugget with sauce. All right. When I, when I think of chicken wings, you're talking <laughs> bone in and that real wing lovers Order bone-in wings. If you love saucy nugs, go pull up to Wendy's. That's what they're running right now as their big advertisement. Go there. They know what you want. They know what you like. They'll get it to you. If you want real wings, you want chicken wings. So That's your hot take is that boneless wings are not wings? It, yeah, it, exactly. It's I don't want to hear someone say, oh, man, I, I love chicken wings. I put down at least 10 boneless wings the, the other day. It's like... Those are some chicken nuggets. Like, you know, yeah. It, yeah. So uh, that's my hot take. Okay. Um, you bone in or, or, or bone out guy? I can eat either, right? Like, sometimes I just like a boneless wing because I think it's easier to eat. It definitely is easier. And I don't want to get my hands messy. But some I don't think taste the same. Like, everyone talks about Ale Emporium here in Indianapolis, right? Indiana, whatever. 
and how they got the best wings ever. But I don't really like their boneless wings. I think they're pretty trash. And I have friends that always get their boneless. But if you get their bone-in wings and you get their special sauce on it, I, I think it's I think it's some of the best wings in the state. So I, I do agree that it is a different flavor. Now let me ask you this. Are you more of a flats guy or a leg person? I, I am absolutely flats. My wife hates it because if we're ever kind of splitting some wings, like why would I go for like the the wings that I prefer the least? So of course I'm going for all the flats. So she's like, you can't just eat all the flats and leave her all the drums. I don't really want the drums. I really don't. So I'm going with the flats as many as I can. That's definitely my go-to. But I have never seen a really prominent wing place advertised to say, we got the best boneless wings you're ever going to have. It's like, okay, all right. Like, well, what about like the real wings? So that, that that's kind of my thing that I don't think someone could be like a diehard wing lover if they're talking about just boneless wings. Okay. Okay. Yeah, no. And I, I think I'm a flats person too. Yeah. I think I used to like the drums better just because it was easier to eat, but I feel like you get more meat in a flat. I completely agree. Typically with the drum, like there's going to be one side that's just, it's kind of hard to get the meat off of. And, and now you're looking at like, all right, that was like half a wing, you know, whatever. But some people prefer them. I, I can't knock it. It's just, I'm just not one of them. All right. Let's go back to, to what I talked about last week, which I haven't got hardly any feedback from. I've got it from a few people. Uh, My uh, wife thought you were insane. With. She thought well, you absolutely insane. Uh, your wife? Was, yeah, when I said it, I raised my hands as if it was like, don't shoot. This was not my take. I just want to pass on a take that Alex said on the show. And uh, But I also think that that would be the reaction of anyone who has – had a wedding day or dreamt of a wedding day or anything of a sort from a female perspective. I, I did tell my wife about my take. Now that some of my friends were talking about it in front of her. And I just said, well, I said, you look beautiful on your wedding day, but I've seen you look better. And she was like, really? I was like, yeah. She was like, Oh, well, thanks. You know, she, she took it as a compliment Okay, where it could have gone a lot of different ways. For her, so I appreciate Would her have. saying that, especially since she's pregnant and you know, emotions can run high with that kind of stuff. Yeah. I am not one bit surprised that your wife disagrees with me because knowing her, she would think that, you know, the complete opposite. So just based on how I know her. Yep. That's my wife. So for my hot take this week, I want to talk about animated movies just quickly. I'm not the biggest movie person, right? But I, I grew up loving Disney movies, right? Totally. And now I feel like we're getting a little bit carried away with these real life animation movies. I don't need to see Lion King redone with real life lions talking. Okay. I'm with, <laughs> like, you. I'm with you on that. Here, here's what There's I'm saying. Much. Like it's a money maker for nostalgia reasons. And I understand why they're doing it. But as a kid, you can kind of believe like this cartoon lion can talk this cartoon, uh, you know, Pum- Pumba and Timon, like they can talk. Right. But like if I see them in real life, they don't even look the same when they like are like real life animals and they're supposed to be animated talking. And I'm just like, what are we doing here? Like some of them are okay. Like the jungle book one wasn't bad, but it's just, to me, they're getting a little bit too carried away. Like we've seen little mermaid happen. Now there's been multiple Mm -hmm. different versions of Peter Pan that have been remade into real life movies. And some of them aren't bad. Some of them are just pretty mid, but I just think we're getting out of hand here, trying to make great cartoon movies, animation movies from Disney into real life movies. And I don't think they're really hitting as much as they think they are. They're they're not, and I did see that Lion King, and honestly, I I left being like, mm, all right, like yeah. To your point, I felt like they did too much. Lion King's meant to be a, a cartoon. You want to have like maybe I'm just sentimental, or that's like the ties that I had to it. Remembering, oh, it's a classic like that. But like, I don't need to see Toy Story and like live action, like someone like like playing Woody. Like, please. Yeah. Leave it as it is. Some things are just meant to be left yeah. how they are. And I'm definitely in agreement with that. They they totally are doing too much. Uh, I did not see Little Mermaid. My wife loved that movie. And just based on the commercials, it was like, ah, I don't feel like I need, like have the need to go see that. And I don't know what else they're going to try and make a quick money grab off of next. But like, I think Snow so- White's in the making. Alice in Wonderland. Allison, so I didn't see those. I didn't see those. They, they I don't just know didn't... if they're out yet. 
That's my well, thing. I think they, they made Alice in Wonderland, Wonderland movies like I guess maybe at this point it was like ten years ago or fifteen. I don't know. Maybe time flies. I, I didn't see those. It didn't really like capture my interest. But I just think that I okay. I did see Aladdin with Will Smith. Right. That was probably the best one. Yeah, like it, it, it was. There's I have no complaints about it. I mean, I, I enjoy Will Smith, so it's like I felt like it was that was a pretty good movie. Um, but yeah, I, I could totally see them trying to. I'm trying to think of what other like cartoon movies they could, from a Disney standpoint, they could re- like, like Shrek. Fox and the Hound. Keep keep Shrek how it is. I, I don't. Shrek's want... not Disney, so that's different. Okay. All right. All right. Well then. But then... I'm thinking like Fox and the Hound. Don't make that. A... They might have already done that. It wouldn't surprise me if they had. I can't remember. But like Bambi, leave that alone. Like these yeah. are supposed to be animated classics. I think they made a live Pinocchio uh, last year. Like, I think me and my wife oh, watched yeah. that one. Forgot about that. I did yeah, not. That, was... see that I think Tom I Hanks just... was in that. I think I blacked that out. It's like ah, I forgot that ever happened. But uh, right, I didn't it's really just talk about it. Yeah, and there's a reason why, right? And it's just like Snow White's coming out in 2025. I just I saw the trailer for. It. That's why I was thinking about it. I'm just like, I I don't have a problem with you know getting creative and like like Toy Story. Like they just continue to keep adding on to the story and adding more and more subplots and new characters or whatever. I mean, it it's a it's a good series as long as Tom Hanks and. Tim Allen are there to do the voiceovers, things like that. But I don't know. I just think at some point you got to stop with that. But at least we're not real life animation. It's, it's still like the Pixar animation, which I can get behind. I don't want, I don't need to see the real life version of that. Like you said. So that's my hot take. It's like these extra movies are making, like they're running out of ideas and they're just doing everything as nostalgia grabs. And it's just very annoying to me. It's like, Let's get more creative. Let's have some new stories and let's write some new stuff. And they 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 have done that, but some of it I just feel like. And like I said, I'm not the biggest movie buff, so like for me to have a movie hot take is probably a little bit surprising. Um, you've gone food the last two ones, so maybe I'll do a food one next time. But it's just I'm trying to think outside the box here a little bit. And when I I think there's another Lion King coming out, if I'm not mistaken, that's why I also saw that too. It's just like what are we doing? Like I could care less about Beyonce Knowles being involved as Nala and she was a ter- terrible Nala to me as well. I thought her voiceover was pretty, pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely didn't think that was like memorable. Yeah. I don't know what the, what the new Lion King would be like, but are, I mean, is it going to be a new story? I feel like it's like, to, I don't know if it's going to be Simba's pride or something stupid. Okay. Just to introduce a new story at this point, I feel like it would be like a little, like, uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you just kind of let it be. And going back to your point on toy story, the last toy story, I don't know. It was just a little bit different. I, I felt like a little bit, not like sad, but I was like, it was a little bit darker than, than what I remembered growing up. Um, I know they're coming out with Toy Story 5, um, but I mean, look, am I going to see it? Yeah, uh, I will. I mean, Toy Story, <laughs> it's Toy Story. Yeah, I will. I mean, uh, uh, it's Mufasa that's coming up. Mufasa, The Lion King. It's oh, uh, okay. It's like, like, a, like a spin off type of thing. An like, adventure I, musical. Oh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah. Mm. I'm not a musical guy. Like yeah. I, I think right now Joker Two is dying a, a hard death. Um, it's getting really slammed as like the worst movie that anyone's even heard of right now. And I think a big part of that is from a musical standpoint. So I don't know if they had to do that with the uh, Mufasa we'll and Lion King. We'll but see. It is what it is. Yeah, I'll be interested to see if they got any of the uh, James Earl jo- uh, Jones voiceovers at all Ooh, before he passed. So. That would, that would be nostalgic, but yeah, I mean, honestly, like, and I, and I'm, I think that Lion King or that Mufasa, uh, I think I saw a, a, a trailer for it on Twitter or something like that. That's probably why, like, it was in my memory, like, to talk about this, but I don't know. I just, I want to watch the OGs. I want to watch the OG cartoons. I think they're better. And that's how I want to remember them. I don't want to remember them as real life characters talking. It just looks so much more unrealistic. I want to see the fake crocodile tear coming out of Simba's eyes as he's underneath Mufasa's arm as he just passed away, a scar killed him. You know, I want to feel that emotion as a kid. I don't want to sit here and see a real life lion cub crying because his dad's dead. I just like, I, I don't want real life stuff. I want the cartoons. Hit me with the cartoons. Yeah. Exactly. Let's just keep it light, keep it how it should be. But hey, well, that's that's our session for some hot takes today. Uh, let us know what you guys think. I think the, the one uh, based on if Indiana does win or not. For uh, the NBA Finals uh, after the brawl, I think that's a that's a very mm. interesting one that could go either way. Yeah, and we're we'll probably at some point bring back fans on this show like we've done before. The trivia just got way too complicated trying to coordinate two people to come on at the same time. We had multiple issues last year as that went along. It was smooth for like the first couple months, and then 
people would flake out and not come on at the right time or their audio would mess up. They weren't in the right spot. So we just said, you know what, we're going to probably just have to cut this for a little bit. Maybe we'll, we'll, we'll redo it with our hot take corner and have our fans bring a hot take to the table as well, just to kind of include them in this conversation. So that could be fun to me, Fachi. But um, other than that, I got nothing else to add. Pacers, good to see them back in action. They'll be back in action again on Thursday night against the Cavaliers, a totally different matchup. See if Miles Turner is able to play in that one. I'm sure that there'll be some added juice to that one as Brian Windhorst listed Jared Allen as number five in terms of the top five centers in the Eastern Conference and left Miles Turner off the list. So I'm sure Miles will take that personally. I know there's a lot of Pacer fans that took that personally and have I've seen quite a bit of Jared Allen slander on my timeline. Don't really feel like that's warranted because I still think Jared Allen's really good. And Fire. he's got an all-star appearance on him compared to Miles. So yeah. I would not necessarily disagree that uh that you know, with Windhorse saying that Allen's better than Turner, but I do think that it's probably closer than Windhorse made it out to be. But I wouldn't say it's as drastically different as a lot of fans have been saying. No, I think if you've made an all-star game, you probably have the right to be put just one little tier above. You know, yeah. it just it's, just, it's an accolade. It's 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 whether you made an all-star team, an, an all-defensive team, you know, any, anything like that is enough to just say, well, this guy's been one of a select few. And I think for right now, Turner's on the outside looking in, but I also feel like, hey, it's harder to crack a top five and I think we've had those debates in the past. Is Turner a top 10 center? To hear that it's closer to top five than it is close to, to top 10, I think that that shows growth. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we, we went through the list, and I think he's gotten so much better the last two years, yeah, too. So definitely. I, I definitely think we feel like he is at least top 10 for sure in the entire yeah. league. Mm -hmm. Where does he rank in the Eastern Conference? I mean, most of your solid centers are in the East. So yeah. but you, got, you got Towns in the East now as a center who I would say overall is more talented than Turner, but like the fit of miles in Indiana is really, really good. And same with Porzingis. Like this is a guy that's really good, but he can't stay healthy. So I get it. It's just, there's a lot of decent centers in the league right now, but it doesn't mean miles is not a good center or a really strong center just because maybe they had Jared Allen ranked above him. So um, anyway, we can move on from that. We'll close things out. Like you said, we're going to wrap things up here. So you can find us on Twitter and on Instagram at Pacerspot STP. Fachi is at underscore F-A-C-C-I on Instagram and Twitter. I'm at Alex Golden NBA on both of those uh, platforms as well. You can find us on Facebook and on TikTok at Setting the Pace. And Fachi, tell everybody where they can find us at on YouTube. On YouTube, we are at Setting the Pace, a Pacers podcast um, on YouTube. Check it out. Um, I, I think I said that right. Usually you YouTube. always say YouTube.com slash Setting the Pace, a Pacers podcast. We can find all of our all of our content, all video of our content. content, man. What is going on? I'm trying to see if you can I mean, follow what I say. All of a sudden, you, I always give out the the, the social I know, media. I was trying to switch it up on you. Hot take, baby. Forget tonight, yeah. Well, hey, that that that's your line. <laughs> so, uh, youtubecom slash, uh, setting the pace, a Pacers podcast. Check out all of our video content Boom. over there. Open up uh, new videos and and love hearing from you guys in the comments. Fachi, if you're excited for the Pacers to brush this loss off in the preseason and get another victory to get the preseason kicked off the way we want it to be against the Cavs on Thursday night. Then hit me with those three words. Let's go Pacers.